And now Chapter 9, The Killing of Danta Vakra, Vidurata, and Roma Harshan. After the demise of Shishupal, Shelva, and Pondra, a foolish demoniac king of the name Danta Vakra wanted to kill Krishna to avenge the death of his friend Shelva. He became so agitated that he personally appeared on the battlefield without the proper arms and ammunition and without even a chariot. His only weapon was his great anger, which was red hot. He carried only a club in his hand, but he was so powerful that when he moved, everyone felt the earth tremble. When Lord Krishna saw him approaching in a very heroic mood, he immediately got down from his chariot, for it was a rule of military etiquette that fighting should take place only between equals. Knowing that Dantavakra was alone and armed with only a club, Lord Krishna responded similarly and prepared himself by taking his club in his hand. When Krishna appeared before him, Dantavakra's heroic march was immediately stopped, just as the great furious waves of the ocean are stopped by the beach. At that time, Dantavakra, who was the king of Karush, stood up firmly with his club and spoke to Lord Krishna as follows. It is a great pleasure and fortunate opportunity, Krishna, that we are seeing each other face to face. My dear Krishna, after all, you are my maternal cousin, and I should not kill you in this way. But unfortunately, you have committed a great mistake by killing my friend Shalva. Moreover, you are not satisfied by killing my friend. I know that you want to kill me also. Because of your determination, I must kill you by tearing you to pieces with my club. Krishna, although you are my relative, you are foolish. You are our greatest enemy, so I must kill you today, just as a person removes a boil on his body by surgical operation. I am always very much obliged to my friends, and I therefore consider myself indebted to my dear friend Shalva. I can liquidate my indebtedness to him only by killing you. As the caretaker of an elephant tries to control the animal by striking it with his trident, Dantavakra tried to control Krishna simply by speaking strong words. After finishing his vituperation, he struck Krishna on the head with his club and made a roaring sound like a lion. But Krishna, although struck strongly by the club of Dantavakra, did not move even an inch, nor did he feel any pain. Taking his Komadaki club and moving very skillfully, Krishna struck Dantavakra's chest so fiercely that Dantavakra's heart split in twain. As a result, Dantavakra began to vomit blood. His hair scattered and he fell to the ground, spreading his hands and legs. Within only a few minutes, all that remained of Dantavakra was a dead body on the ground. After the death of Dantavakra, just as the time of Shishupal's death, in the presence of all the persons standing there, a small particle of spiritual effulgence came out of the demon's body and very wonderfully merged into the body of Lord Krishna. Dantavakra had a brother named Vidurata, who was overwhelmed with the grief at Dantavakra's death. Out of grief and anger, Vidurata was breathing very heavily, and just to avenge the death of his brother, he also appeared before Lord Krishna with a sword and a shield in his hands. He wanted to kill Krishna immediately. When Lord Krishna understood that Vidurata was looking for the opportunity to strike him with his sword, he employed his Sudarshan Chakra, his razor-sharp disc, and without delay cut off Vidurata's head with its helmet and earrings. In this way, after killing Shalva and destroying his wonderful airplane, and then killing Dantavakra and Vidurata, 
Lord Krishna at last entered his city, Dvorka. It would not have been possible for anyone but Krishna to kill these great heroes, and therefore all the demigods from heaven and the human beings on the surface of the globe were glorifying him. Great sages and ascetics, the denizens of the Siddha and Gandharva planets, the denizens known as Vidyadharas, Vasuki, and the Mahanagas, the beautiful angels, the inhabitants of Pitraloka, the Yakshas, the Kinaras, and the Charanas, all showered flowers upon him and sang songs of his victory in great jubilation. Decorating the entire city very festively, the citizens of Dvorka held a great celebration, and when Lord Krishna passed through the city, all the members of the Vrishni dynasty and the heroes of the Yadu dynasty followed him with great respect. These are some of the transcendental pastimes of Lord Krishna, the master of all mystic power and the lord of all cosmic manifestations. Those who are fools, who are like animals, sometimes think that Krishna is defeated, but factually he is the supreme personality of Godhead and no one can defeat him. He always remains victorious over everyone. He is the only one God, and all others are His subservient order carriers. Once upon a time, Lord Balaram heard that an arrangement was being made for a fight between the two rival parties in the Kuru dynasty, one headed by Duryodhana and the other by the Pandavas. He did not like the idea that he was to be only a mediator to stop the fighting. Finding it unbearable not to take an active part on behalf of either of the parties, he left Vorka on the plea of visiting various holy places of pilgrimage. He first of all visited the place of pilgrimage known as Prabhasakshetra. He took his bath there and he pacified the local Brahmins and offered oblations to the demigods, pitas, great sages, and people in general in accordance with Vedic ritualistic ceremonies. That is the Vedic method of visiting holy places. After this, Accompanied by some respectable Brahmins, he decided to visit different places on the bank of the river Sarasvati. He gradually visited such places as Prituduk, Bindusara, Tritakup, Sudarshan Tirtha, Vishala Tirtha, Brahma Tirtha, and Chakra Tirtha. Besides these, he also visited all the holy places on the bank of the Sarasvati River running toward the east. After this, he visited all the principal holy places on the bank of the Yamuna and on the bank of the Ganges. Thus he gradually came to the holy place known as Naimasharanya. This holy place, Naimasharanya, is still existing in India and in ancient times it was especially used for the meetings of great sages and saintly persons with the aim of understanding spiritual life and self-realization. When Lord Balaram visited that place, there was a great sacrifice being performed by a great assembly of transcendentalists. Such meetings were planned to last thousands of years. When Lord Balaram arrived, all the participants in the meeting great sages, ascetics, brahmins, and learned scholars immediately arose from their seats and welcomed him with great honor and respect. Some offered him respectful obeisances, and those who were elderly great sages and brahmins offered him blessings by standing up. After this formality, Lord Balaram was offered a suitable seat, and everyone present worshipped him. Everyone in the assembly stood up in the presence of Balaram, because they knew him to be the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Education or learning means to understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, although Lord Balaram appeared on the earth as a Kshatriya, all the Brahmins and sages stood up 
because they knew who Lord Balaram was. Unfortunately, after being worshipped and seated in his place, Lord Balaram saw Roma Harshan, the disciple of Vyasadeva, the literary incarnation of Godhead, still sitting on the Vyasasan. He had neither gotten up from his seat nor offered him respects. Because he was seated on the Vyasasan, he foolishly thought himself greater than the Lord. Therefore he did not get down from his seat or bow down before the Lord. Lord Balaram then considered the history of Roma Harshan. He was born in a Sutta family or a mixed family, born of a Brahmin woman and a Kshatriya man. Therefore, although Roma Harshan considered Balaram a Kshatriya, he should not have remained sitting on a higher seat. According to his position by birth, he should not even have accepted the higher sitting position because many learned Brahmins and sages were present. Lord Balaram also observed that Roma Harshan not only refused to come down from his exalted seat, but did not even stand up and offer his respects when Balaramji entered the assembly. Lord Balaram did not like the audacity of Roma Harshan and became very angry with him. When a person is seated on the Vyasasan, he does not generally have to stand to receive a particular person entering the assembly. But in this case, the situation was different because Lord Baladev is not an ordinary human being. Therefore, although Roma Harshan Sutta was voted to the Vyasasan by all the Brahmins, he should have followed the behavior of other learned sages and Brahmins present and should have known that Lord Balaram is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Respects are always due him, even though such respects can be avoided in the case of an ordinary man. The appearance of Krishna and Balaram is especially meant for re-establishment of the religious principles. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita, the highest religious principle is to surrender to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam also confirms that the topmost perfection of religion is to be engaged in the devotional service of the Lord. When Lord Balaram saw that Roma Harshan Sutta did not understand the highest principle of religion, in spite of his having studied all the Vedas, he certainly could not support his position. Roma Harshan Sutta had been given the chance to become a perfect Brahmin, but because of his ill behavior in his relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, his low birth was immediately remembered. Roma Harshan Sutta had been given the position of a Brahmin, but he had not been born in the family of a Brahmin. He had been born in a Pratilom family. According to Vedic concept, there are two kinds of mixed family heritage called Anulom and Pratilom. When a male is united with a female of a lower caste, the offspring is called Anulom. But when a male unites with a woman of a higher caste, the offspring is called Pratilom. Roma Harshan Sutta belonged to the Pratilom family because his father was a Kshatriya and his mother a Brahmin. Because Roma Harshan's transcendental realization was not perfect, Lord Balaram remembered his Pratilom heritage. The idea is that any man may be given the chance to become a Brahmin, but if he improperly uses his position of a Brahmin without actual realization, then his elevation to the Brahminical position is not valid. After seeing the deficiency of realization of Roma Harshan Sutta, Lord Balaram decided to chastise him for being puffed up. Lord Balaram therefore said, this man is liable to be awarded the death punishment because 
although he has the good qualification of being a disciple of Lord Vyasadeva, and although he has studied all the Vedic literature from this exalted personality, he was not submissive in the presence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita, a person who is actually a Brahmin and is very learned must automatically become very gentle also. But although Romaharshan Sutta was very learned and had been given the chance to become a Brahmin, he had not become gentle. From this we can understand that when one is puffed up by material acquisitions, he cannot acquire the gentle behavior befitting a Brahmin. The learning of such a person is as good as a valuable jewel decorating the hood of a serpent. Despite the valuable jewel on the hood, a serpent is still a serpent and is as fearful as an ordinary serpent. If a person does not become meek and humble, all his studies of the Vedas and Puranas and his vast knowledge in the Shastras are simply outward dress, like the costume of a theatrical artist dancing on the stage. Lord Balaram considered, I have appeared in order to chastise false persons who are internally impure but externally pose themselves to be very learned and religious. My killing of such persons is proper to check them from further sinful activity. Lord Balaram had avoided taking part in the Battle of Kurukshetra, and yet because of his position, the re-establishment of religious principles was his prime duty. Considering these points, he killed Romaharshan Sutta simply by striking him with a kusha straw, which was nothing but a blade of grass. If someone questions how Lord Balaram could kill Romaharshan Sutta simply by striking him with a blade of kusha grass, the answer is given in the Srimad Bhagavatam by the use of the word Prabhu or Master. The Lord's position is always transcendental, and because He is omnipotent, He can act as He likes, without being obliged to the material laws and principles. Thus it was possible for Him to kill Romaharshan Sutta simply by striking Him with a blade of kusha grass. At the death of Romaharshan Sutta, everyone present became much aggrieved, and there was roaring and crying. Although all the Brahmins and sages present knew Lord Balaram to be the Supreme Personality of Godhead, they did not hesitate to protest the Lord's action. They humbly submitted, Our dear Lord, we think that your action is not in line with the religious principles. Dear Lord Yadunandan, we may inform you that we Brahmins posted Romaharshan Sutta on that exalted position for the duration of this great sacrifice. He was seated on the Vyasasan by our election, and when one is seated on the Vyasasan, it is improper for him to stand up to receive a person. Moreover, we awarded Romaharshan Sutta an undisturbed duration of life. Under the circumstances, since your Lordship has killed him without knowing all these facts, we think that your action has been equal to that of killing a Brahmin. Dear Lord, Deliverer of all fallen souls, we know certainly that you are the knower of all Vedic principles. You are the master of all mystic powers. Therefore, the Vedic injunctions cannot ordinarily be applied to your personality. But we request that you show your causeless mercy upon others by kindly atoning for this killing of Romaharshan Sutta. We do not, however, suggest what kind of act you should perform to atone for killing him. We simply suggest that you adopt some method of atonement so that others may follow your action. What is done by a great personality 
is followed by the ordinary man. The Lord replied, Yes, I must atone for this action, which may have been proper for me, but is improper for others. Therefore I think it is my duty to execute a suitable act of atonement enjoined in the authorized scriptures. Simultaneously, I can also give this Romaharshan Sutta life again with a span of long duration, sufficient strength, and full power of the senses. Not only this, but if you desire, I shall be glad to award him anything else you may ask. I shall be very glad to grant all these boons to fulfill your desires. This statement by Lord Balaram definitely confirms that the Supreme Personality of Godhead is free to act in any way. Although his killing of Romaharshan Sutta may be considered improper, he could immediately counteract it with greater profit to all. Therefore, one should not imitate the actions of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. One should simply follow the instructions of the Lord. All the great learned sages present realized that although they considered the action of Lord Balaram improper, the Lord was immediately able to compensate with greater profits. Not wanting to detract from the mission of the Lord in killing Romaharshan Sutta, all of them prayed, Our dear Lord, the uncommon use of your Kusha weapon to kill Romaharshan Sutta may remain as it is. Because of your desire to kill him, he should not be brought to life again. At the same time, your Lordship may remember that we sages and Brahmins voluntarily gave him long life. Therefore, such a benediction should not be nullified. Thus, the request of all the learned Brahmins in the assembly was ambiguous because they wanted to keep intact their benediction that Romaharshan Sutta would continue to live until the end of the great sacrifice. But at the same time, they did not want to nullify Balaram's killing him. The Supreme Personality of Godhead therefore solved the problem in a manner befitting his exalted position. He said, Because the Son is produced from the body of the Father, the Vedas enjoin that the Son, the son is the Father's representative. Therefore I say that Ugrasrava Sutta, the son of Romaharshan Sutta, should henceforth take his Father's position and continue the discourses on the Puranas and because you wanted Romaharshan to have a long duration of life, this benediction will be transferred to his son. The son, Ugrashrava, will therefore have all the facilities you offered, a long duration of life in a good and healthy body with no disturbances and full strength of all the senses. Lord Balaram then implored all the sages and Brahmins that aside from the benediction offered to the son of Romaharshan, they should ask from him any other benediction, and he would be prepared to fulfill it immediately. The Lord thus placed himself in the position of an ordinary kshatriya and informed the sages that he did not know in what way he could atone for his killing of Romaharshan, but whatever they would suggest, he would be glad to accept. The Brahmins could understand the purpose of the Lord, and thus they suggested that He atone in a manner beneficial for them. They said, Our dear Lord, there is a demon of the name Balbal. He is the son of Ilval, but he is a very powerful demon, and he visits this sacred place of sacrifice every fortnight on the full moon and moonless days and creates a great disturbance to the discharge of our duties in the sacrifice. O descendant of the Dashara family, we all request you to kill this demon. 
We think that if you kindly kill him, that will be your atonement on our behalf. The demon occasionally comes here and profusely throws upon us contaminated, impure things like pus, blood, stool, urine, and wine. He pollutes the sacred place by showering such filth upon us. After killing Balbal, you may continue touring all these sacred places of pilgrimage for twelve months, and in that way you will be completely freed from all contamination. That is our prescription. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purport of the third volume, ninth chapter of Krishna, the killing of Danta Bakra, Vidurata, and Romaharshan.